Hello everyone, this is Dr. Ashwarya Kaushik from the Premier Endodontics and Conservative Dentistry Institute. Uh, today we are going to be starting with the rubber dam series and today we are going to be uh, uh, discussing the various, you know, problems that we encounter with rubber dam and the troubleshooting part one, right? So let us just see what is most important in terms of the number of teeth that we isolate, right? And how we really go about uh, effectively putting the rubber dam and simultaneously addressing the issues that may arise because of, you know, say, fracture or breakage of the rubber dam clamp at the level of the bow or, you know, inadvertently or by mistake, the operator dropping the rubber dam clamp from the forceps into the mouth, how, how we retrieve it, the anchor teeth, how apart from the clamps, they can be, you know, well isolated, and kept isolated during the entire procedure, right? So let us just see these things in slight bit of a detail. As you can see, I'll just share the screen here. It now is the big screen mode, yes. Now, as you can see on your screen here that, um, okay, before we discuss this, uh, we all know that when we are doing endodontics for root canal purpose, only the tooth that is being operated on is isolated. So we are dealing with single tooth isolation for root canal treatment procedures. But what about isolation when we are doing restorative dentistry? So for that, student gives us very clear cut guidelines, right? What are they? Now, if we are doing uh, procedures, operative procedures on the incisors and on the mesial surface of the canines, right? On the incisors or the mesial surface of the canines, then our isolation goes from four to four. That is first premolar of one side to the first premolar of the opposite arch, right? The Of the left side right? Then second situation, if we are doing say a procedure on say a, a canine, right? Apart from the mesial surface, then we need good enough, you know, good enough tissue retraction and a nice plane to put our finger rests. Then the preferred, you know, way of isolating is going right from the first molar to the opposite side lateral incisor, right? So for the canine, except for the mesial surface, we go for, my, for isolation from the first molar, that's number six, right? The first molar to the opposite side, lateral incisor. Now, what about premolars? If you are doing procedures on premolars, then preferably isolate at least two teeth distal. That means if I'm performing a procedure on a first premolar, right? Then I should isolate the second premolar, that's five. I should isolate the first molar, that's six. And on the opposite side of the arch, I should go on to the lateral incisor. That would give me a nice plane to work on, right? Then what is the next situation? If I'm isolating the molars, again, the key tooth, that is the lateral incisor of the opposite arch and the anchor tooth, as digitally as possible. So if I'm able to say, you know, if my eight is well erupted and I'm working on the first molar, then I should clamp the eight. If eight is not there, then obviously I cannot do anything. I have to clamp the seven, right? And go to the opposite side, lateral incisor. Now, <clears throat> what is, what if, you know, uh, there is a problem in achieving this ideal isolation, then what do I do, uh, right? Then there is a concept known as limited isolation, right? What is, according to student, limited isolation? According to student, limited isolation is that whatever tooth you're operating on, try to isolate at least one tooth posterior and two teeth mesial to it, right? Two teeth anterior to it. That is limited isolation. Now, according to... <clears throat> The ORE guidelines, that's your exam for your entry into the United Kingdom. What is the minimal criteria? That is even slightly simpler than what the limited isolation of student tells us. That is <clears throat> isolate irrespective of whatever situation. Isolate at least one tooth posterior and one tooth anterior. 
right? So I think that solves the problem of identifying and selecting how many teeth that are supposed to be isolated. Now, let us look at this classic example that I've shown here. This is an example wherein we are performing, say, for example, I'm performing, say, a procedure on restorative procedures on, say, this tooth, that's your central incisor of the third quadrant, lateral and canine. So according to limited isolation, I would isolate at least one tooth posterior. That's my four. That's my first premolar. And two teeth anterior to the operating, or to the tooth that is being operated on. So that's my fourth quadrant, central and lateral. Right? So that's done. That's according to the limited isolation according to Studevant. So this is satisfactory. That's one issue. Now, the second problem that comes in terms of troubleshooting is the choice of the rubber dam sheet, right? Now, here, if you can see here, this is one of my cases I was doing in my practice. Similar situation. This is my central lateral canine, right? This is a tooth here is missing. And this is a splinted crown on the lateral and the canine. Now, I was going for restorative procedures on sand on this one, two, and three. Now, what I went for is limited isolation, but the mistake or the problem that was done here is what? I chose a medium thickness of rubber dam sheet, that is 0 0.08 inches. The problem with this is, you can see here that there is a gap when I you know, punched holes and I tried to, you know, retract and pushed it to, you know, stabilize it on the rubber dam on this Young's frame, rubber dam frame. There was this gap formation that took place around the cervical area. This gap will not take place if I chose, if I would have chosen a heavier sheet, that is a thicker sheet. So from medium, if I would have chosen this sheet, that is a thicker sheet, which has a thickness of 0 0.10 inches. This problem would not have been there. You can see here, nice adaptation with no gap in the cervical areas. Then what is the next thing that is that, that the problem that we normally do? We put our clamp and we don't secure it with floss, right? So the problem is that if the clamp fractures here and if we are using a technique in which we are putting the clamp first, it can fall in the patient's mouth. How do we retrieve it? So ideally, you have to pass your dental floss through the first hole here of your of one jaw of the rubber dam clamp, loop it around, then again take a couple of loops through the rubber uh, through the clamp bow, bow of the clamp, and then again loop it around through the other hole on the lingual side of the jaw, right? And then, okay, many a times we do this. Then what happens? The remainder of the, you know, the, the floss, it's, it's like lying hanging through the side corner of the mouth getting contaminated. So what we need to do, we need to secure it and ligate it to the side of the rubber dam frame that's here. So that would give us, you know, that would, that would you know, uh, this, this would help in keeping in mind that, okay, fine. You know, uh, we have a floss, which is, which we've used to secure our rubber dam clamp. Then apart from the, um, the, the, um, the uh, rubber dam clamp, what are the other ways of, uh, of ensuring that you know, our anterior anchor tooth is also, you know, the rubber dam sheet is well secure there? Either you use a clamp. If you're not using a clamp, normally the contact points are pretty tight in the lateral incisor here that we don't need anything. However, what are the accessory anchors? What we can do is we can use a widget, right? We can use a widget. We can use dental floss. We can use dental tape. And also one more thing that is known as double tie floss ligature. This is how we secure the rubber dam to the cervical area of the anchor tooth with the double tie floss ligature. Fine, we've done this. Again, very important. It is to secure this double tie floss ligature and ligate it onto the rubber dam frame, right? This is again a problem which I did not do, right? I realized it later and you can see here in this picture, I have well secured this double tie floss ligature 
to the rubber dam frame here, right? So I think, you know, uh, these are the common problems that we encounter. Sometimes we forget doing it, right? So this was a presentation, basic presentation, part one. There are other components of rubber dam also, but just a short and, you know, the most important points that I could think, uh, you know, are clinically relevant, the things that we keep doing wrong. For you know, we, we at my institute at Premier Endodontics and Conservative Dentistry Institute, we teach this, we take full courses. So just in case you want to take a complete course where we have a lecture, we give demo of all the situations of rubber dam isolation and we and we make the candidates do it right there in front of us. So that's me, Dr. Ashwarya Kaushik, and we have Dr. Sukhwant along with the entire team. You can contact us on these numbers. This is my number. This is Dr. Sukhwan's number. You can simply, you know, go to Google, type Premier Endodontics and Conservative Dentistry Institute, and you will be directed to the website there, right? So that would be it for now. Best wishes to all of you. Thank you.